A warm welcome to the worship of God at this our united service. It's good to be back among you again after our holiday. Thanks to all who took services and looked after things while we're away. Special welcome to any visitors who may be with us this morning. And after the service, tea and coffee as usual through in the large hall there. Do join us if you can. Enjoy a time of fellowship together. We're moving this morning from live streaming the services to putting them on our YouTube channel and the TV online church platform for people to view after the end of the service. Um, the numbers engaging online are reduced very much to a very small number, uh, and this seems to make sense. It still gives the opportunity for those who are unwell who can't come to church or are elsewhere to be able to pick up and join in worship after like sometime after half eleven for this morning's service and so on, sometime during the course of the day. So just to be, make you aware of that, uh, and there's a note on the TV online church platform to that effect. Our YouTube channel is at the at sign TV at church. The prayer meeting recommences Thursday, this Thursday, 3rd of August at 7 p.m. We are about to the 7 p.m. time on Zoom, all are welcome to that. If you need a link, just ask me. Next Sunday, 6th of August, the United Morning Services once again here in TV at uh, 10.30. And in the evening, next Sunday at seven o'clock, we commence our series of three prayers for a summer evening services up at Roberton Church. Uh, all are welcome to that. Ashley will be speaking at that one. I look at him, yes, he, he is confirming that, uh, and then I'll be doing the next one. And then the third one, we're going to repeat what we did last year and have a songs of praise uh, with various people contributing hymns and saying why they've chosen them. So uh, I'll be in touch with various people in that regard. Magnitude is an annual Christian youth festival for young people aged 11 to 18. It took place at Lendrick Muir uh, from Saturday the 22nd to Wednesday 26th July. Andy Mayberry, for the second year running, was on the team of about 100 people uh, helping at Magnitude, and he's coming now to give us an update on what uh, happened this year. Yeah, so again, um, I was at Magnitude, so this is a, a youth conference for um, basically um, secondary school kids. And there were uh, 700 kids, plus their youth leaders, plus a team of about 130 volunteers that I was on. So my role was very much in the background, uh, looking after the radios that we used for communications between uh, the various teams, and also acting as the anchor point for uh, uh, any incidents that happened, um, missing children and, and things like that. Um, and we did have a, a few of those through the, through the week. But we had a significantly larger team this, this year, which was great because it meant that I was able to get up to the, the, um, the main events where there's you know, a, a big top um, filled with a thousand folk. And it was just amazing to see the youngsters really engaging in this, worshiping the Lord, um, expressing their joy and um, commitment, you know, just all, all out. And then, you know, in the midst of it all, you'll see a wee kid sort of, rather than joining in the exuberant uh, singing, just lying there reading his Bible. Um, and it was just in, immensely encouraging to be involved in that and to, to, to play a part. Uh, one of the things that really struck me, as well as that sort of enthusiasm and engagement, was that there were times of um, celebration, time, lots of singing, and you know, the kids really engaging in that. But there, there were also times of worship uh, and, uh, sorry, times of prayer. And there was a five minute slot, uh, and you can't see this, it's a poor picture, but up on screen came 
this one minute long, you know, let's everybody sit and in quiet, listen to God and see what he wants us to pray about. A full minute. These secondary school age kids and they sat there listening to God, seeing, discerning what God wanted them to pray about. And in the second minute, they were to kneel. And everybody knelt and spent another minute listening to God to discern what he wants them to pray about. And then for the final three minutes, they stood up and in their groups, just clustered around and prayed out loud, you know, hundreds of groups around the tent, praying out about what God had shown them. So that struck me greatly. Um, And, you know, God moved powerfully. There were... uh, Dozens of kids uh, giving their life to Christ, uh, chanting out the theme of the the, the week, uh, just under a week. Um, you know, I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. And to hear these hundreds of kids chatting out. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. And there was this um, couple of big boards, you know, standard eight by four boards, which were painted up um, and and the kids put their handprints on. And then um, later on, they, they wrote what God was telling them, what they had learned from the teaching and their interaction and just some of these comments uh, bring a lump to my throat. Um, and um, yeah, I am compassionate, unique, God's child, valued, forgiven, strong. Um, yeah, just pace through them. Wanted, loved, chosen, amazing. No longer a slave to fear. Um, God is for me, not against me. Um, Creative, desired, powerful, made in his image. You know, these kids really grasped what the message was, that God loves them, he's chosen them, he has made them to be his, he's got a purpose for their lives. Um, And I was just really encouraged to to, to be a part of that. So thanks for praying for me, those of you who were, you know, knew that I was doing this and and, and praying behind the scenes. Um, It was a fantastic time. There's a wee video which we'll maybe play later uh, when we're through at coffee. Bless you all, thank you. Stay there, stay there. Mm -hmm. Not, Not scheduled, but I think that'd be good to do. Thank you, Lord, for Andy being able to be part of this event at Magnitude, for your working through all the generations, for the power of your, the good news of Jesus, which doesn't change the same yesterday, today, and forever. Bless these young folk, those who made commitments, all of them who are there. May they go home strengthened to stay the course and to be a blessing to your church and to your world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our opening uh, praise. My hope is built on nothing less than the modern version with the chorus cornerstone in it. My hope is built on nothing less. We'll stand to sing.
voice. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but holy trust in Jesus. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, with your servant Moses, we proclaim, oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. As we come to you, Father, in worship and praise, we are so glad this is who you are, perfect and unchanging in your character, in your justice, love, and goodness. We don't come to you this morning depending on ourselves, in our frailty and fickleness and with our failures and sin, but leaning all our weight on the solid rock who is Jesus Christ, your Son. No matter how we're feeling today, elated, or downhearted, 
We thank you for the stability we find in Jesus, arising out of your faithfulness and your steadfast love. In Jesus, we can stand firm before you forever, clothed in his righteousness through faith in him who died for our sins and rose again in power. There is no defeat in him. God, our Father, there are times when darkness seems to veil your face, but in those times we keep trusting your unchanging grace as we pray to you and wait for the dawning of the light of your face, which is always turned towards us in Christ, even though clouds at times hide it. As we come to you, we confess our sins, which mar our fellowship with you. As we do that, please assure us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness through Jesus' death on the cross. Father, bless us now as we gather before you in worship. We seek you. We seek your face. We seek that encounter with you as we gather together by your Holy Spirit as you are making all things new in your Son. Please come by your Holy Spirit to renew and refresh us. May we be changed by being here together with you this morning. And may you be glorified in everything, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bring our prayers in Jesus' name and now continue with the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're returning this morning to our series in Matthew that we left a few uh, months back to return to finish Isaiah, um, and uh, we have a reading from Psalm 126 as well as a reader from Ma- reading from Matthew, and Sandy's going to come and read for us now. Thanks, Sandy. Our first reading this morning can be found on page 623 of the Pew Bible. It is Psalm 126, 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Our second reading is taken from Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17, and can be found on page 974 of the Pew Bible. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No. 
they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Amen. We're going to sing again now. We'll remain seated for this because it's a bit longer and there's an instrumental bit in the middle. I love you, Lord, and then followed by how sweet the name of Jesus sounds to the tune, Rachel. Remain seated for this.
Lord Jesus, as we have sung your praise. Enable us now to come to your word and hear what you have to say to us. Take these weak words of mine, and may you speak your words of power and truth and your purposes through your word today. Amen. Sometimes the first steps a person takes towards faith uh, in Jesus is that they realize that there's something different about a Christian or Christians they have come into contact with. And they think, there's something different about them. There's something they have, and I'd like that too. And I'm reading from Matthew 9, the disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus and ask, a question about why it is. It's quite a strange question. Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't? It's interesting. They're asking a question about something they do, and they don't seem to know why they do it. It just starts in passing. Why do we, the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees, fast, but your disciples, Jesus, don't? And Jesus answers them using three parables, as is his wont. Jesus wonderfully describes himself as the bridegroom. Matthew 9, verse 14 to 17. We're on, of course, if you want to have it in front of you, it'd be useful. Uh, verse 15, Jesus describes himself as the bridegroom. He has come to bring about the restoration of of a perfect, loving, and joyful relationship between God and His people. He is the bridegroom that Isaiah spoke about in Isaiah 62 verse 5 that we looked at not long ago. As a bridegroom, that's God, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. The church is the bride, Christ is the bridegroom, at the glorious marriage to come. We are being prepared as a bride for that day, that glorious day when the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready, Revelation 19, 7. What a wonderful picture Jesus gives of the Christian life, that it's a relationship of love and closeness and intimacy mirrored in marriage between a man and a woman. Our wedding's a time of joy and gladness, isn't it? We were blessed at the start of our holiday to be uh, guests at the wedding of our niece, uh, Fiona, to John in Dundee Central Baptist Church. Uh, a lovely Christian wedding in every sense. What an encouragement that was in itself. But it was great to be there. We went for the reception afterwards to a place I've never been to, Backhouse Rossi Estate near Ochtermachty. Great name, that isn't it? They call it Machti locally. Here we were, and it would have been strange indeed if we'd sat down at these long tables in the converted barn there, if the, some of the master of ceremonies had stood up and said, the couple have decided that we're going to have a fast today. No food is being served. That would be strange indeed, wouldn't it? Uh, a fast to mark a wedding would give a very interesting kind of signal about what this marriage was all about, wouldn't it? No, of course we didn't have a fast. We had a feast. In fact, there was too much food, really. It was wonderful, uh, an abundance of food. This wasn't a time of mourning. It was a feast of celebration of this beginning of a new life together, Fiona and John. As Christians, Jesus is our glorious bridegroom. A new day dawned with the coming of Christ. He came as the fulfillment of all the Jewish laws, ceremonies, sacrifices, and so on. He fulfills them all in himself, and therefore they are the shadow, and he is the reality. An old order has, a new order has come. The old order is gone. So fasting is practiced by the Pharisees 
and even the followers of John the Baptist was part of that old dispensation. Jesus here on earth with his disciples, they did not fast. Jesus fasted in the wilderness, the start of his ministry, but when he was with his disciples, they didn't fast. Uh, But after Jesus ascended to his Father, and a new period began with the gift of the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost, Jesus taken up to the Father and he's returning again. In these days between the first and second coming of Christ, yes, we will fast. That's what Jesus says. A time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. But while he is with them, no mourning. So we are in that day between the first and second coming of Christ. It's interesting how few references there are in the New Testament to fasting. Jesus does say in the Sermon on the Mount, when you fast, rather than if you fast, he's anticipating this time when there will be fasting as appropriate. There are only two references I can find, and concordances back me up, two direct references to fasting in the book of Acts as the early church grows. First is Acts 13, two and three. In the church in Antioch, we see the church gathered and they are worshiping the Lord and fasting. And then the Holy Spirit says to them, send out Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. And they send them out, pray and fast and send them out. And the second one is Acts 14, 23, where a number of new churches have been brought into being in what's now Turkey. And Paul and Barnabas appoint elders to lead these churches, to oversee them, to, be, to care for them. And with prayer and fasting, Paul and Barnabas commit them to the Lord in whom they'd put their trust. You see, these two references are instructive because, do you notice they both speak about new things, a new direction in mission in the church there in Antioch, breaking out, Paul and Barnabas sent out. And the other one is new leadership. It's always a significant time for a church. So fasting has many uses, including for people to be set free from oppression and various things that bind them. And the the power of the devil is strong. The, The prayer earnestly with fasting is called in then to enable that concentrated prayer for the person to be set free. But from these references in Acts and Jesus' own fasting in the wilderness at the start of his ministry, it seems that fasting has a particular place when we are seeking God for something new. Isaiah 43, 18, forget the former things, do not dwell in the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I've spoken often about St. Michael of Belfry Church in New York which saw marvelous growth and blessing and renewal in all kinds of ways. But right at the start, when David Watson and his wife Anne went to St. Cuthbert's in York in 1960s, they didn't see much happening in the parish and they felt the need for sustained prayer. Here's what David says. We had no children at that time and there were very few meetings. (laughs) What a blessing. So it was easy for us to do something about this not see much happening, so on. Every Wednesday we spent most of the day in prayer and fasting as we worship God, reading the scriptures together, praying about everything in the parish and asking for God's guidance. We knew that in any church there are always 101 good things one can do, but, we, but what was God wanting us to do in our church at this time? We kept up those days of prayer for the best part of a year, and during that year, most of the significant developments in the church came from those days. Through them, we gained a sense of God's direction for his work. And as we face such challenges, uh, changes that cause us concern, and what on earth's going to happen in the church with all the changes that are proposed need to be worked through. Here's an important call to us today to engage with God in prayer, with fasting, if that should be appropriate, so that our will is aligned with God's will and what He wants happens. What He wants to happen is what 
happens so that we don't run around in all kinds of different directions like headless chickens, but are directed by the Lord in the way he wants us to go. There's also prayer and fasting for restoration. That's why I chose the Old Testament reading from Psalm 126, that beautiful picture at the start. God has done great things for us, so he has. And they were filled with laughter, their tongues with songs of joy. They felt as if they were dreaming what God had done, what God has done for us in Jesus. The fresh awareness of that brings that kind of experience, that joy. They, oh, they were just on cloud nine. But then there's a change of mood in Sam, and the Sam is the psalmist turns to their current predicament, their challenging situation, whatever it was, and he cries for restoration back to what they once were. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, the psalmist cries. Jesus says here in the parable, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. You know, what a need there is in these days. Don't you think these are very confused and confusing days in so many ways? You've got to keep your head. It's not easy sometimes. There's such great challenge to the truth of Christ and so many things that we held completely dear and undermined and changed and transformed. How we need to cry to God earnestly asking him to restore the honor of his name and the goodness of who he is and his ways so that people will turn to him and glorify him in this day and generation. So there's two calls there just arising out of, there's so much that could be said about this, this passage. Jesus is a bridegroom. When he's taken away, they will fast. We need the direction that he gives. We need earnestly to pray with fasting as appropriate. Not all the time, but when it's appropriate. To discern his will for us as we move ahead and as we cry for him to restore the honor of his name in his church, in this place, this land, this world. So that's the, the bridegroom. Move on to the next two parables as Jesus continues to answer this question about the difference between him and his disciples and John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees in their fasting particularly. The patch of cloth on the old coat. See the picture there. Verse 16. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch will pull away from the garment making the tear worse. The picture is clear. If you uh, patch up an old coat with a new unshrunk piece of cloth as soon as the coat gets washed, the new cloth will shrink and tear away, and in fact, it will be worse than it was before because the coat will be torn and it will just look terrible. There's a picture there. I've got a wee note down here. Sounds like some of my DIY work uh, when I attempt things that I shouldn't attempt. The garment is Judaism. Jesus says you focus on a particular practice, fasting, where there's a difference. We don't do that anymore. So maybe you're thinking that if we import this particular different way of doing things back into Judaism, then it'll be improved. No, says Jesus, that's not what I've come to do. That won't work. Who I am and what I bring is so radically different and new that what you need is a new coat, like the one on the left, not a patch on your old one. We can't just import things and improve things into our lives. Jesus isn't some kind of addition uh, to make our life better in a therapeutic sense. He comes to make the whole thing new. The new wine in the old wineskins. Got a picture for that as well. Verse 17, neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. 
Michael Green says, old wineskins are shriveled hard and cannot cope with effervescent new wine. New wineskins are needed. Arthur Wallace says, the old Judaistic wineskin was not a suitable receptacle for the new wine of the Spirit. Jesus brings something radically new. He brings the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament predicted. He can never be an addition. Try and keep things as they were without him and then put him in as well. It won't work. You demean him and also the thing you're trying to preserve won't be preserved. It won't work. He's not just an improvement. He cannot be contained in the previous way of things. A totally new receptacle is needed for the effervescent new life of Christ. New wine needs new wineskins. Isn't this also very challenging? It certainly applies to, to Judaism and Jesus coming to make all things new the shadow becoming the reality and all is new in that sense as a church now. But you see, we can't just leave it at that and that's not, I believe, what Jesus intends us to leave it at. It is about us now. Uh, We need to apply this to our personal life, but we also need to apply it to the church life that we are living. We cannot escape the message here that what is needed in the church is continued renewal of its life. In Jesus comes total newness of life. He's not a patch-up job. He's not, uh, it's not that we have him and keep our old life the way it was. His coming changes everything, and that's unsettling. And there can be a temptation to say, look, I'll just ease off here and sit in the sidelines and take things easy and be a passenger here till I get to glory. No, we need to embrace what Jesus' purpose is for our life, whatever stage we're at in our life. We need to face that and accept it and rejoice in it. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus of the Christian life in terms of new birth It's as radical as that, and it's ongoing as radical as that. uh, uh, All we are needs to be continually renewed. The stuff, the fabric of the church needs to be continually renewed. The church needs to be renewed to be a fit vessel for the new wine of the Holy Spirit, always up to date. Now, given the current decline we see in much of the church here in Scotland and the West, we can see, can't we, that something radically new has to happen to the church in its life and worship, its structures, its way of operating to face the challenges of the day. And over the last decade or so, we've heard much about the church without walls, the mission-shaped church. Uh, mending, changing the church so that it connects with people outside the church and is culturally relevant, open and welcoming to the neighborhoods or networks of relationships that we, we move in. In terms of our worship, think of our age demographic, lack of children and families, our buildings, the way we reach out to people or don't the way we organize ourselves, and so much more. All that is so true, isn't it? But you see, it's so much deeper than just the shape of the church or what we do, how we do things, even how we worship, or whatever it might be. Because the Apostle Paul tells us that the church is the body of Christ, a living, organic, spiritual entity. Do you think of yourselves, ourselves as like that? The church therefore has an identity of its own as the church, as the body of Christ, deriving from Christ himself. We are his body. 
Uh, and that identity has to be expressed in where we are and the culture we live. Uh, we, that's unavoidable, whether we like it or not. We always wear some particular cultural clothing. But the church has its own identity, the new identity these parables speak about, the new coat, the new wineskin. <laughs> new. As Jesus' baptism, we see him fully identifying with the people round about him, the people he came for. He was baptized too, but he had no sin. He identified without losing his identity as the Son of God. He was a friend of sinners, and yet he was never a sinner in any shape or form. Jesus' ministry was mission-shaped, shaped by the mission of God, shaped to reach the lost, to achieve all that he came to do in his love. Yet he remained who he was in himself, the Son of God. Uh, this is a Christ-like way, uh, and it's so important. Uh, it, it's a church's way too. John 17, Jesus' prayer, they are not of the world even as I am not of it. So we are in the world, we're engaged in the world, we work, we play sports, we rub shoulders with folk, we go to the shops, we, whatever it is we might do, we're with people, but we're not of the world. This distinctiveness, you know, do you agree with, the, do you feel this, this need paradoxically for distinctiveness? Uh, as the world moves away in a different direction more and more from Christian values and so on. The temptation is for us to uh, accommodate that and become so immersed in the world that we, are, we lose our saltiness, we lose that distinctiveness, and therefore we're no use to anyone, although we're as involved as you can be Neither are we to retreat. Wouldn't this be lovely into a, a private world where everything was wonderful and everyone's a Christian and worship is fantastic and there's no challenges? Well, that'd be difficult even in a church setting. We cannot withdraw into a modern kind of monastery and be sound and have no engagement with the world out there. So what is needed? this renewal that Jesus comes to bring, the renewal of his church in her identity as the bride of Christ, in our doctrine, what we believe and how we behave, we worship how it's expressed, it's all deriving from this newness that the Holy Spirit comes to bring in us. the end of the day, the newness Jesus speaks about in these parables is not really about us being with it on the right side of history or whatever we might want to say. The new cloth and the new wine are Jesus himself, so the whole coat and the wine skins need to be new because of him, because he is eternally up to date. The living Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is always bang up to date. Therefore, if we're in him and we're moving in his leading in everything we are and do, we will have that influence. It will flow out by his leading and his gifting, empowering the wisdom he gives us and so on. We're talking about spiritual renewal here in the church, but we cannot speak of that, can we? As something separate from you and me, for you and I are the church. Those who believe in Jesus, that's the church. There's no such thing as a perfect church here on earth, uh, because as soon as we join it, um, another sinner has joined it. Another sinner saved by grace. Groucho Marx said, I wouldn't join a club that would, I refuse to join any club that would have me as a member. You know what he means, because we 
are imperfect people. So how can there be a perfect church when people search around for the perfect church as soon as they join it? There's a problem. You and I are the church. Church is not primarily about structures, ways of doing things, building styles of worship. It's a body of Christ, as we said. We are the bride of Christ. So it's in the first instance not really the church that needs renewed. It's me, it's you. So as we come to a close, will you ask Jesus to renew you spiritually? Receive him afresh. Open your heart to him afresh. Open yourself to be filled with the Spirit. Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Go on and on being filled with the Spirit. Open yourself to be filled with the Holy Spirit so he can do a new thing in your life and through you in the life of his church and out there in the world. Not a patch-up job, not a making do as we are, like an old wineskin, but a thoroughgoing renewal. He's been working on that in many of us for years, this renewal. Change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. Ask him to carry on that work and deepen it even today. Or maybe it's not yet started in you or hasn't got very far. Open the door to that renewal that Jesus brings by his Holy Spirit today. So may it be that others looking at us as individuals and as a church fellowship will say in a good way, there's something different about them, you know. What is it? I want that too. And find it in Jesus, the one who makes everything new. Amen. I think we'll just move to the prayer if this is possible, Andy, at the back. And can we have um, one shall tell another at the end? Good. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we praise and thank you for the radical newness Jesus, your Son, has brought about through his becoming one of us, through his life, his death, and his resurrection, so that trusting him we become a new creation in him, we are united to him by faith and are made part of your church, his bride. He is our bridegroom and we await the glorious marriage of the Lamb in heaven. Lord, will you do a new thing in us, in your church, in this day and generation? Will you restore the honor of your name and your people? We cry for this, Lord, so that people will see the wonder of who you are and just how good the good news of Jesus is and discover for themselves the riches of your grace. Enable us to stand for you and your truth fully and to engage with those around us in your grace and truth fully. We offer ourselves afresh to you today. Cleanse us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Renew us deeply within with your resurrection power. Transform us by the renewal of our minds. Please give us fresh spiritual power to live for you as pleases you in holiness and joy. Father, we dedicate ourselves to you, and with ourselves we dedicate our offerings, a token of the giving of all we are and have to you. Father, we bring before you this world in all its brokenness and need. There is so much we could pray for. But we think today of the many millions of people facing hunger, in East Africa especially. Have mercy on them, Lord, we cry. As your Son taught us to pray for our daily bread, so we pray that too for those needy people. Lord, we pray for the production and fair distribution of food throughout the world. In particular, we ask that Ukraine's Black Sea ports can be opened once again 
and that the Danube distribution channels can function freely. We ask for our UK farming industry for blessing in their production of food and for them to have freedom to function and a fair financial return for their labor. Lord, we pray for peace and stability in Niger and the surrounding nations as we hear of the military coup there. We praise you, Lord God, that you're indeed sovereign over all the affairs of humanity. You rule over history, and you're working out your perfect purposes in Jesus Christ, your Son, in your justice and mercy. Until that day, Jesus comes again, and there is a new heaven and a new earth. We hold to that in faith. And Father, we bring to you those among us, unknown to us, who need our prayers because of what they're going through. We name before you those who are unwell, asking you to touch them with your power. We pray especially for Jean Strathy, who will be 101 tomorrow, giving you thanks for her long life, for her faith in Christ, and your love for her. Please be with her in her frailty, as she has not been well these last few days. And Father, we ask you to comfort those who are bereaved. We remember especially the family of TV member Margaret Ray, who died on 22nd July. Her husband Douglas, who has just now moved into St. Andrew's Care Home, her sons Douglas and Stephen, and the family. Please be with them and all who mourn in your compassion. We long for that day when even creation itself will come into the glorious freedom of the children of God, liberated from its bondage to decay through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now in a moment of quiet, Father, we bring our personal concerns and burdens to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers as we bring them in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we change things slightly, we'll sing now our closing hymn, and it is One Shall Tell Another. We'll stand to sing. shall tell another and he shall tell his friend husbands wives and children shall come following on from house to house in family shall all be gathered in and lights will shine in every street so warm and welcome in Faith is yet allowed 
to thrillers and surprises with his sovereign power. When darkness has been darkest, the brightest light will shine. His invitation comes to us, it's yours and it's mine. And serve the Lord. And let's say the grace together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>